Welcome back to the 27 and to episode 3 part 2 of setup shorts. Today we'll be taking a look at dampers once again but from another perspective from last time where we focused on chassis control. This time we'll be looking at how to use dampers for traction or in other words how they handle specific track features like bumps, rumble strips, curbs and the tarmac itself. If you can recall from the last time we discussed how dampers can affect car handling in what is called the transient state the state where the chassis of the car is moving. This time, transient state doesn't matter. Instead, we are dealing with traction here and how we control the unsprung weight of the car. We know by now that the dampers and springs work hand in hand. Technically, dampers introduce resistance to the springs and by stiffening or softening the dampers, we are adding resistance when it is compressing and decompressing. But the goal with traction is to achieve what is called critical damping, which is the balance we are seeking between the damper not absorbing enough force or absorbing too much. In the first case, the wheel will bounce up and down on the track, giving you inconsistent load and grip. The second case, the energy will be transferred to the car itself, which will, you guessed it, give you inconsistent load and grip. Perceiving issues with critical damping in sim racing is one of the most difficult and elusive things to do when at the wheel. There are signs you can look for when sitting in your seat though, but the first thing we need to do is focus perspective and look to the circumstances and features of tracks that cause critical damping issues and work from there. The first rule is, critical damping is only really important when the car is going over stuff. If your track is as smooth as a plate of glass, no bumps, no rumble strips, no curbs, traction is almost a given. Contrast this with places like Imola, where you'll be engaging rumble strips and curbs all over the place, and places like Sebring or historic tracks where the tarmac itself is bumpy. The second rule is to recognize the damping package you have on your car. This determines the tools at your disposal to deal with these things. If you're driving a modern racing platform such as a GT3, you'll see a four-way damping system where you can ignore the low speed section altogether, focusing entirely on the high speed or fast dampers only. This is the advantage that four-way dampers have and why they're considered modern. For older or simpler racing platforms, you'll see two-way dampers. These are just dampers, they do it all. Here we need to find the right balance between transient chassis control and the traction we're talking about today. And this is where we'll begin our demonstration. We're here in the Formula Trainer Advanced again, this time at Imola 1972. This is a non-aero car. And we're going to concentrate on Tamburello Curve, which at that time was very high speed and rather bumpy. We're in steady state here. Transient and chassis control doesn't really matter. We've done all the work with the springs, ARBs, and found the damping package that is to our liking for cornering. Now we're going to focus on the traction differences of a two-way damping system. On the left of the screen, we've stiffened the front dampers to the maximum and kept the rear dampers at default. On the right, we have kept the front dampers at default and stiffened the rear dampers to the maximum. I want you to focus on the wheel inputs and pay attention to the right side of the steering wheel, specifically how many lights of the rev limiter are covered up by the wheel itself. On the left, we have to register more wheel inputs to complete the corner at full speed. On the right, less. The car is not in transient for very long. The sweeping nature of the corner itself means the car is in steady state Therefore, the cornering difference you see here is simply a matter of differences in traction caused by the dampers. For steady state cornering on a bumpy track at medium to high speeds, if you are encountering understeer tendencies, softening the front dampers and stiffening the rears in equal measure may help you complete the corner in an otherwise balanced car. For oversteer tendencies, the opposite. Stiffening the front dampers and softening the rears can calm the oversteer tendency. Keep in mind we are talking about fractions of cornering ability here in a car with no aero. The more aero capability your car has, the less this type of change will matter. However, these fractions add up. 
they add up in tire heat, they add up when conditions are less than optimal. If you can take Tamburello stacking one to two Celsius less right front tire heat each time around on a hot day, by the end of the race your right front tire will be in better shape than your opponents. So let's move on to high speed damping using a four way damping system. We are here in the BMW M6 GT3 at modern Imola this time, but as you know, there are some chicanes and corners with rather lofty curbs here and how your car handles these curbs can make or break your lap times or your race. In this example, we have stiffened the high speed damping of the BMW by quite a bit. We are using the Variante Alta as our testing chicane. I would like you to not only watch the chassis movement, but listen to the car as well, specifically how the engine revs when hitting the curbs and the rumble strips on corner exit. With a stiff high speed damper when hitting curbs the car will react more severely. You are likely to feel it through your force feedback more sharply as well. After the curb the car will plant almost immediately. The car is launching off the curb and then landing with a thud. Over the rumble strips you will hear the engine increase revs while you go over them. These are the tires skipping over the rumble strips. This next example we have done the opposite and softened the high speed dampers to the minimum. Again, watch and listen. When hitting the curbs the car will feel like it absorbs the curbs itself better. But pay attention to how the rear of the car reacts after the curbs though. It wobbles and the revs are oscillating as well. Over the rumble strips the car glides over them more smoothly and if you pay attention to the revs it doesn't peak like the revs do with the stiffer package. So you can see that the stiff high speed dampers can be problematic. When going over curbs, especially at the limit, they also don't handle rumble strips very well, but the car almost instantaneously settles for traction. Softer dampers handle the curbs and rumble strips better, with a bit more traction and control, however the rear of the car will oscillate providing inconsistent traction when accelerating. What we're looking for here ultimately is balance between the stiffness and the softness. The goal is soft enough to handle the curbs and rumble strips and stiff enough to apply traction when you're past the track feature itself. It's that simple. The problem ultimately is we don't always have time to watch the car in chase cam. Test day, yes. Race day, no. So listen to your revs. If your car feels severe and gets peaky revs over track features, try softening the high speed dampers. If the car is handling the track features better, but the revs oscillate to the point where you're losing traction after the feature, stiffening the dampers will be in order. In summation, for two-way damping systems, making minor changes to dampers can influence traction, especially on bumpy tracks. If you want to touch more oversteer, try softening the front dampers and stiffening the rears both in equal measure. If you want to touch more understeer, you would do the opposite, stiffen the front dampers and soften the rears in equal measure. Why would you want to induce understeer, you might ask? Pretty much because the front tires might be a lot cooler than the rears. A couple of notes. 
can use these changes sparingly. With two-way dampers, they still influence the car in transient conditions. Second, the stronger the arrow the car has, the less impact this will have, but they will have some. So treat this as a sort of minute change in between wing settings, for example. For four-way damping systems, the signs we are looking for when going over track features are the severity of how the car reacts by its response over the feature itself and through your force feedback, and then how the car is revving and when. If the car is reacting severely and you are hearing peak revs when going over track features, try softening the high-speed dampers. If the car is reacting less severely over features but the revs oscillate too much after you pass over them and are trying to put the power down, try stiffening the high-speed dampers. A final note here is basically a reminder that dampers and springs work together. If you are making damper changes and you can't quite get the feel that you want, you might have to try different spring settings and start all over again. So that's high speed dampers, a pretty long video for something even I thought would be rather simple. From a technical level, changes like this might amount to a mere tenth per lap. Over the course of 10 laps, that's a second, not much, but still something. But vastly more important is your own comfort. The real value in a change like this isn't pure pace on a perfect lap versus a perfect lap. It's the reduction of the risk of spinning out if we can reduce that risk and widen the window of controllability, that's track position and podiums, folks. Up next, we'll be taking on the next big challenge, and that's tuning the clutch plate differential. A lot of misunderstanding in this area, so make sure to click the clicks you need to if you're interested. In the meantime, thanks for watching and take care.